Bridlington with its scores of chip shops, thousands of grockles and never sleeping gulls has been well worth a visit and we had a splendid forecast for the short 15 mile hop around the corner to Scarborough. Boat trips were busy shuffling in and out of the harbour. And you can even see their donuts on Google Earth. Between Bridlington and Scarborough, there's something I've been looking forward to for many years. A chance to sail close to the mightily iconic Flamborough Head. The head is a spectacular five mile length of 17 million year old chalk that the sea has diligently sculpted into intensely crinkled cliffs with many blowholes, caves, arches and stacks. And some of the caves are 50 metres deep. The whole area is a paddler's wet dream. And even in a yacht, you can get right up under the cliffs. The water is 50 metres deep, just 10 yards from the bottom of the cliff. Gannets, gulls, kittiwakes and puffins are everywhere because the head is home to over 200,000 pairs of seabirds. I've spent many hours with my binox viewing the cliffs from above, but never down here at sea level. Astonishing. You know, people used to come to Flamborough Head to shoot birds, but that was banned in 1868, the first bit of bird protection legislation ever drafted in the UK. <laughs> These are the first real cliffs we've seen since leaving Dover five years ago. It's a great place to watch birds now though, although I do confess that occasionally, on a warm summer day, it well, does pong a bit. Me, I want Here's the thing, 180 years ago the American sea captain and hero John Paul Jones, I can see you yanks swelling with pride, with three other vessels, two from France, was patrolling the North Sea looking for easy targets. They spotted a British convoy heading for the UK from the Baltic. It was guarded by two small naval vessels who, despite being outnumbered and seriously outgunned, stoutly put themselves between the convoy and the dastardly Yanks with their flakily perfidious French allies. Despite the inequality, the plucky British tars gave them the run for their money but were eventually beaten. 300 blokes lost their lives and the incident was lauded in the American and French press as one in the eye for the British. Headland at Filey is absolutely foul with lobster pots. 
probably 60, 70 markers. Great place for my wife to catch a mackerel. Put it up here. So we have a fish. My wife is a fisherman, but she's not a fish killer. <laughs> it's big and it's very jumpy. We'll put it in the green bucket. It's a big oh, one. Good oh, one, Jill. Oh, wow, that is a cracking good mackerel. Oh, well done. Oh, you can just let it die. Oh, oh, how long does it take to die? I have no idea. Oh. Scarborough Harbour. The pilot. A visit to Scarborough restores one's faith in the great British seaside resort. It's a superior example of the genre, but above all, the style is given by the superb location, the castle standing on its rock between two fine sweeping bays. There you go, Scarborough Castle. The only blot on the landscape is that. Jimmy Savile has been buried here. Bummer. Size of this stuff. Crackers. Shoelaces too. Yes. One done up, one undone. Even got the veins on his hands. Grand, and it also 
also used to have a funicular railway. If you don't know what that is, look it up, you lazy gits. And this lovely bridge here. You know, there are a few things as glorious as the moment in a boat when you turn off the engine and the sails start to take up the slack. The weatherman had predicted a four or five westerly, so there was plenty of wind, and as it was still offshore, the water was flat. KTL slipped into the groove and we worked our way northwards. The coast looked lovely, bright and emerald green on top of the cliffs. I confess we sailed right past Robin Hood's Bay. Just saw it in the distance as KTL romped on. I had hoped to call in, but the weatherman said no, so here is a frozen frame of the place. It is very nice, it really is. Next time maybe though. Once I got close to Whitby, I tried contacting the authorities. Yacht Katie, Yacht Katie, called it, calling Whitby Watchkeeper, over. Yacht Katie, Yacht Katie, calling Whitby Watchkeeper, over. But they weren't listening, which is far from unusual and suits me fine. Yacht Katie, Yacht Katie, calling Whitby Watchkeeper, over. During the last few miles, the coast takes a bit of a turn to the west, so the harbour really faces north. Hence the elaborate harbour entrance. It really is a most dramatic place with the perfectly formed ruins of the abbey overlooking the sea.
Gently sloping sand beaches inside the harbour mouth play an important role in taking the energy of the waves before they get into the inner harbour. Pontoons are tucked away upriver, but the entrance is blocked by a bridge that can be rotated out of the way, although it does keep some pretty weird hours. You know, I've never been to a town that is quite so obsessed with its own history, both real and imagined. The Abbey, which is a perfect ruin, was built in the 600s by St Hilda, then sacked by the Vikings, then rebuilt by the Normans, then destroyed by Henry. Up until 1600, it was a tiny, tiny place. There were only about 20 houses in Whitby. Then a local landowner found a deposit of alum. It was discovered up in the hills. It was used for fixing paint, dyeing cloth, tanning leather and flocculating gritty water. And until then, the Spanish had cornered the whole trade. So industry in Whitby was underway, with coal coming in and alum leaving. Whitby people started building their own ships, and in 1753, the first whaling ship set out from here. Then they needed even more ships, and by 1790, it was the third largest shipbuilding town in Britain, beaten only by Newcastle and London. Captain Cook, of course, came from this area, and all four of his ships, feel free to name them, Endeavour, Resolution, Adventure and Discovery, were built here. The town has been milking the Cook connection ever since, and the trip boat is a replica of the Endeavour, a repurposed Whitby collier. References to him are all over the place. Whitby also has a brilliant museum jam-packed with an absolute multitude of great stuff. Shipping, As the man on the desk is all too keen to tell you. By the Napoleonic prisoners of war out of bone food scraps. If that's not exciting enough for you, there is a severed hand with magical powers. The hand of glory. Can't guarantee the powers, definitely severed. Unfortunately, more gory than glory. New extension. Door on the far left there. Through that door on the far right is the exhibition room. That's about fungus. It might sound a bit boring, but it will grow on you. <laughs> Uh, just take care when you go in there because there's not much room, uh, but you'll be okay because you look like a fun guy. Uh, right opposite that, there's a, a lecture room. In there, there's some uh, boards on when uh, information boards about when Brown. The crow's nest was invented here, apparently. <laughs> this is one. So the master used to sit in it. You can see that he can rotate it so that he can have a windbreak. And there's a seat and a rack for his telescope and a hole through the floor. Goodness knows on this one. This is the Endeavour made out of matchsticks. Two years, 22,364 matchsticks. It really is a most eclectic museum. Trousers from a suit of coconut fibre armour. Goodness gracious me. I guess these guys went all over the world.
but the desire to look back at the past in Whitby extends even to a past that never existed. Bram Stoker's novel Dracula featured the town, and what with the Abbey and the Dracula steps, it really is big on Gothic. Whitby is also keen on jet. It's a shiny black mineral, ideal for making gothic-themed jewellery. And here's the thing, jet is ossified wood from the monkey puzzle tree. And that is one of the facts that will stick with me for ages. One thing that really is worth doing is to prowl the streets of night once all the grockles have gone to bed. Parts of Whitby look pretty much the way they did a couple of hundred years ago. You can see the way that the stairs here are worn out along the handrail because people have held the handrail to go up. Middle ones are not nearly so badly worn. Well, Jill has left me, not forever, just to go home and uh, look after my daughter, the dog, the garden and her mother's kitchen. I think she's going to come back in two weeks time, so just you and me for two weeks. Going to leave here today and go to Stades, which is only about five miles up the coast. Little drying harbour, I uh, won't have to pay, stay there for the night. Got the bike with me, so intend to spend a fair amount of time ashore. That's the game.
is quite roly-poly today. Uh, Runswick Bay, my plan is to come in here tomorrow is to come out again and mess about with this coast. Tomorrow I will have to leave Staves at disgustingly early in the morning and so that will give me all day to mess about along this coast. I might come back this way a little bit. Depends what the wind does really. So tomorrow after I've done this it's up the River Tees. Meantime back on with the engine sadly. Well Runswick Bay is supposed to be an anchorage. <laughs> Doesn't look like much much like one today. settles down and in the morning I assume it's going to wake me up at about four o'clock as the tide comes in. I could have done with going aground further up the beach but uh, since I didn't know the lay of the land and there are quite a few rocks, um, Sean who runs a holiday company and owns that red boat over there. Said that I could moor up beside him, but his boat might roll onto mine, which wouldn't be good, or I could moor up here. And he assures me that when I go down, it'll be flat. However, it's quite deep, so still haven't touched bottom yet. Fortunately, I have loads and loads of fenders, but it is rocking around a fair bit. 